would like to commence the evening by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today, the Gadigal and Mongol people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I extend that respect to any Indigenous, um, Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Sovereignty was never ceded. We are thrilled to welcome you all to Active Centre Australia uh, tonight for the Whispering Loudly networking and panel event. We're excited to welcome back ACA alumni Rosie Lord. Um, Rosie Lord is a multi-hat filmmaker who has acted, <laughs> produced, written and directed across web series, TV, features, theatre and VR. Rosie was formerly the investment manager for online production at Screen Australia, as well as a co-vice president of WIFT New South Wales. She currently sits on the Screen Australia Gender Matters Task Force, is an active member of Screen Vixens, and is a proud ambassador for Active Centre Australia. On that note, I will now hand over to Rosie to officially commence the evening. Please give her a warm welcome. Thank you. Hi everybody, um, and thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, this is a little more overwhelming than I was expecting it to be, as se several of you um, encountered by tears in the foyer. Um, but thank you all for being here. The social anxiety is real, I'll tell you. Um, I would love to firstly just extend the acknowledgement of country for the people of the lands that all of our panellists are joining us from today. And then for everyone and anyone who's watching this at a later date to acknowledge the countries that you are currently on, wherever that may be, reflect on whether those lands were ever ceded and whether, whether sovereignty was ever ceded and pay your respects to elders past, present and emerging as well. Um, I would like to commence today, tonight, um, by a fair few thank yous. So let me just get those through. We are obviously here to, uh, um, inspired by the incredible Dark Whispers Volume 1 anthology and the incredible team that has been behind all of that. But as we all know, films don't get made uh, by themselves. There are lots of puzzle pieces that go into making them. So let me just rattle off a couple of those. So Hemlock and Cedar Films, which is the company behind Dark Whispers Volume 1, uh, The Stranger With My Face International Film Festival, the New South Wales chapter of WIFT Women in Film and Television Australia, Screen Vixens, Film Fatales, and for tonight as well, a big thank you to the City of Sydney, which is the key funding body for this particular event, and obviously Actors Centre Australia for being the incredible venue partner. So thank you for all of those organisations for helping us put this together. <laughs> So yes, Dark Whispers, Australia's first female horror anthology. My first question is, why did it take so long? <laughs> but thank you for putting it together. So the people that we have here tonight are an incredible mixture of humans. We have sitting in person with us, Megan Riakos, who is the creator, producer of Dark Whispers and also wrote and directed the interweaving segment, the book of Dark Whispers thread, she is the writer, director, producer of her debut feature, Crushed, and is also a co-founder of WIFT Australia. Very impressive human. <laughs> Next to Megan, we have Enzo Tedeschi, who was the executive producer of Dark Whispers, a longtime multi-hat genre filmmaker, creating such critical successes as The Tunnel, uh, The Crossing, Event Zero, Anthology, A Night of Horror, and now another an horror anthology, Dead House Dark, which both Megan and myself are also worked on, um, <laughs> which uh, is going out on Shutter later in April. <laughs> Up on our Zoom, where you can see all of these wonderful people, we have Brian Kidd down the bottom here, who is one of the Dark Whispers, is the Dark Whispers associate producer and director of the segment Watch Me. Uh, among many filmmaking adventures in 2012, she co-founded Stranger With My Face International Film Festival, which promotes female perspectives in genre filmmaking. Yay! <laughs> uh, let's go around the corner. We'll go up the top then. We have... Angie Black, who is the director of the segment Birthday Girl. We have Katrina Irawati Graham, who is the segment, uh, the director of, and writer of White Song, and is also the chair of the Queensland and Queensland board member of WIFT Australia. In, down in here, we have Marion Polowski, the director of the segment The Ride. 
In the middle, we have Isabel Peppard, the director of Gloomy Valentine. And over on the side here, we have Jub Claire, who is the writer and director of the segment Storytime. Thank you everybody for joining us. So besides my first question of why has it taken so long for Australia to have a horror anthology film which is directed by women, how did all this come about? Where did it start, Megan? It started with Stranger With My Face International Film Festival. So Bryony is the co-founder of that and a number of the people in this tile, this gallery, um, we met there and that was, I think it was 2012. I can't quite remember the year I first got there, but basically I'd made a short film. Um, I didn't realise it was a horror film until Bryony <laughs> said, hey, do you want to program, we want to program your film. Do you want to come down? And I was like, I thought it was a psychological drama. <laughs> Even though the main character is haunted by a demon throughout the entire film. So I think- The things like, we don't see. Yeah, I think, I think the idea is, is that um, a lot of women are making horrific, you know, horrifying films or films with horrifying themes and they don't quite realise it because it doesn't look like what we've seen on our screens. And, and that's because women have often been absent from um, the creation of those projects. And so we don't seem to, I think, I don't identify with it in that way. Um, and look, there's been some great horror films that I love, but they're not necessarily ones that I see myself in. So long story short, went down to Stranger With My Face, found this amazing group of women making all these really incredible films. But I, I noticed that those films weren't necessarily giving them the opportunities that they deserved. At the same time, I um, made my first feature, Crushed, and it was outside the system, so it was an independent film. And so I didn't quite realise, I mean, I knew it was hard to fund a film, but because I was working outside the system, you know, I was heading it up, you know, the lead actress and fellow producer is a woman, and then we had um, Robbie Miles, so that's Sarah Bishop, and Robbie Miles was the other producer. So it was a female heavy creative team. So it didn't feel like a, you know, a patriarchal film. I'm not saying that all these other films are, are that, but the idea is it's by the time that it came to marketing and distributing the film, I had to rejoin really kind of the industry in mm. order to sell it. Mm -hmm. I realized how incredibly sexist the industry was. Yeah. And so those two things combined, you know, the, meeting these amazing women in these films that I thought were great. And then also going, oh my God, this is so incredibly hard to sell my film because the people I'm selling it to are sexually harassing me in the middle of a meeting. So, oh, really? <laughs> so yeah. you know, okay. to put a positive spin on that, um, this was pre-Me Too and I don't think it would be so overt these days. I just <laughs> went, it's time, you know, Am I being too optimistic? <laughs> no, I was just saying. In the middle because, of a meeting. I'm hoping that it wouldn't happen in the middle of the meeting. Yeah, I'm just saying. Like, no, I think <laughs> I think I, I was laughing at the fact that just because like subtle sexism and, and sexual harassment is that much better. It's not. I mean, <laughs> the tricky the tricky bit. I mean, this is a whole nother discussion, Sorry. but it's the tricky bit of overt sexism versus subtle sexism. Welcome, Can everybody. both be as harmful. <laughs> can both be as harmful as each other yes um but this was overt yeah. and so yeah. it was very obvious to me what was going on so long story short I was like okay it, you know I got into WIFT got into advocacy and it had been a little while since Crush had come out I wanted to create another project um I didn't have the like I didn't have the energy or the money or the emotion to do another fully independent feature and I had met Enzo um, very briefly during Crush and he gave me some really great advice, but we weren't friends. He was just a, like a good guy who gave me some advice because that's what, you know, good guys do. And I knew that he had made a horror anthology called A Night of Horror. And I was like, oh, that's a really interesting approach because it's something that it's a curation. So you do a call out, the segments already pre-exist and then you, you know, create um, a package, the, the wraparound to, to pull it all together. So, um, yeah, so I contacted Enzo and, and thought, you know, maybe Enzo, you can tell that part of the story. <laughs> uh, sure, yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, so I think actually we, we met at um, the Night of Horror Film Festival the year that anthology was screening and Crushed was screening that year as well. Um, but yeah, Megan uh, came to came to see me with this um, idea, this amazing idea, and I was kind of like, "Well, cool. I mean, if I can help, I'll help." Um, and you know, o over time, looking at these amazing films and, and whatnot, uh, I, I became a lot more interested in, in the project at large, and it kind of 
don't know, just a, I can't even remember how I came on officially. Like it was really just a brain pick in the at, at the beginning. It was kind of like avoiding the pitfalls that I went through with with, with, with Night of Horror uh, uh, anthology. Um, and yeah, I just got deeper and deeper, and here we are. I don't really know how much more there is to that particular story. From it's. Well, it sounds like it was a no-brainer. It's such a brilliant idea. 100%. And with such incredible talent, with projects already sitting ready-made, it sounds, yeah, absolutely. Mm. Bryony, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how this all came about from your end. Um, yeah, so St Stranger With My Face, the film festival, um, basically kind of came out of the women in horror movement, which is um, big in around the world but in the United States and myself and another Tasmanian filmmaker Rebecca Thompson had been really supported by that network so we kind of wanted to in turn create an opportunity that was supportive for Australian uh, women making horror so yeah Megan uh, was one of a sort of core group within the festival I guess where she had her her short film there initially and then she sort of kept coming back and a few people did like Katrina and Isabel and various people like that and so we just sort of all got to know each other and so and it became a really close-knit group and I think um, when Megan said she wanted to do this project of course my immediate response was just obviously I'll support it however I can um, the festival will support it however it can because um, we just have all of these sort of shared goals I suppose around creating opportunities and particularly understanding that there's this huge wealth of genre talent in Australia that is very much untapped um, and that's not even just women or you know diverse people that's just in general I mean Enzo would know that like there's just so much going on that's interesting and exciting and there's sort of no pathways for it often so um, we're just both very um, on the same page with, with all of that. And then Megan's enthusiasm for this project is quite infectious. And, um, you know, she's got this really can-do attitude. And I was really excited to see that she got Leonie Marsh um, on board as a producer too and Enzo as, you know, executive producer because it's really hard to do it all by yourself. And she has done a tremendous amount with this project. But... Um, you know, it's too much for one person to do everything by themselves. So it's been really beautiful to see that really create a collaborative spirit emerge with this project um, behind Megan and then all of us filmmakers together, getting to know each other and supporting each other's work as well. And hopefully our careers beyond this project. That's what I would love to see happen. Absolutely. It feels like this is a real turning, well, not a turning point, but a key milestone it's, it's kind of funny because I was reflecting back on the process of it and everyone's short films were made in isolation, not thinking necessarily how they fit, that they would link up and fit into a, a mm. pack. Um, and then to see them almost reborn in a way in, in a collective story sounds, is just phenomenal. Um, but what I'd love to do for, as we continue talking is to broaden out this conversation beyond just around dark whispers, but to speak more broadly around how each of you have um, come along in this journey and where those short films kind of sat within your journeys as filmmakers to lead you to hear and what's, what, and as we keep talking, what the thoughts are for the future. Um, so I would love to hear, actually, Isabel, are you able to talk to us about how you got, where you're at in your career at the moment and how you came into where you're at right now? Yeah, sure. Um, so I've just finished uh, co-directing a feature documentary called Morgana, which had its world premiere at Melbourne International Film Festival in 2019 and also screening competition at Sydney Film Festival this last year. Um, I'm currently developing a feature kind of hybrid feature animation, horror gothic fairy tale, um, and also a stop motion virtual reality film <laughs> set inside a woman's heart. <laughs> um, so, um, and yeah, so Gloomy Valentine where it sits in my career was my very first film. Um, 
I never went to film school. I don't have a university education at all. Um, I started out about 20 years ago as a special effects artist um, and in learning um, the skills and disciplines around special effects. And that was because I was into horror even 20 years ago. So I was, um, you know, indulging in my love of gore and viscera and creatures. Um, so I learned all these skills uh, associated with special effects, including stop motion animation, uh, but also kind of sculpture, costume making, um, creature building, all of this different stuff. But um, I felt like I was someone who had a lot of my own stories to tell. So rather than kind of moving towards being a technician, I wanted to use all these kind of weird and wonderful skills to interpret my own experience um, as a woman in the world, you know, which I guess I perceived had a bunch of horror attached to it, um, you know, psychological horror and the kind of visceral horror of that experience, I guess. So, um, so I used a lot of those skills and that training to start telling my own stories. And the first story was Gloomy Valentine. Um, and um, yeah, I guess that spoke to me of, you know, these kind of cycles of pain that I'd gone through psychologically. Um, and the, the lyrics of the song really resonated with my experience on a personal level. So it was kind of um, this um, thing that I used as a catalyst to interpret, you know, into that animation. Wow, as your first film, that's extraordinary. I had no idea that it was actually your first, mm. your first but not your first. Um, Marion, do you want to chat about where, where um, the ride sat, sits in your career? Well, uh, my background on, on one level is quite similar to Isabel. I hadn't, didn't go to film school and I didn't go to university, but um, I had a, a huge love, always did have, for film and television. Uh, absolutely addicted to it, still am. And uh, I worked in uh, television programming and then I went to, um, from television programming to uh, being an executive in charge of investing on behalf of organisations into uh, features and things like that. I did a lot of that in Australia uh, for five years. So, you know, the kind of Robert Connolly's and... Um, Rosemary Blight and Rachel Perkins and David Caesar and all of those people, you know, I was that executive working for a company investing in those films uh, it, with the company was called Showtime. But eventually I started producing and then I just gave myself permission to do what I'd always wanted to do, but never felt that I could because I had other responsibilities. And that was to write and direct. And I figured that because I was a woman over the age of 50, and hadn't made a music video or worked for an ad agency, I wouldn't just be given something that I would have to make something. So I thought, well, I'll make, I'll make a few short films. And unbeknownst to me, my father had written under a false name because at the time it was, you know, what he was writing about was very contentious. It was South African apartheid and all of that kind of thing. And he'd written this short story about this guy who gets picked up by a, a racist um, farmer so I just reset that in modern time Dorset and um, Anthony Lapalia happened to read the script because I was working with him producing something else and just said, I want to play that driver. So I'm like, okay, you know, if you want to, there's no money, I can give you 40 quid. I think I paid him 40 pounds. And um, yeah, it was really shocking because he, he, for him, because we drove down to Dorset, which is like a five hour drive from London in a minivan with the, you know, most of the crew. And I'd packed little breakfasts and sandwiches the night before for everybody. And there was no toilet where we were working. And yeah, I think Anthony probably regretted it, but he did good. <laughs> I mean, he was being paid a fortune on some American, you know, show. I can't remember what it's called, Without a Trace. And um, yeah, whoo, yeah. <laughs> and, it was, and it was his first, it was his first, uh, uh, English film so that was good and then Ed Spaliers who was this gorgeous guy agreed to play the student and um, we just got the Chinese guy down where we were filming and you know everybody mucked in but the I mean just before you go on the interesting thing about the ride was that as my first feature um, short I decided that I didn't want to have too many men on the crew because I knew that I couldn't talk technical and I just didn't want to get that fucking bamboozled 
you know, and then look like the idiot. So I got a female DP and a female focus puller and a female editor and, uh, you know, just every single role I could fill with women I did. And, and, and not because, I would love to say it's because I was, you know, an activist and, you know, really kind of, you know, woke or whatever term you want to use, but it wasn't. I just did it for my own instinctive uh, psychological preservation, making a first um, short film. And it was the best thing I ever did. Very smart. Um, Angie, you're nodding along very feverishly. Do you want to um, chime in? Absolutely. Um, I've, I've had a different trajectory. I, I have gone to film school um, and I got to the end of film school and went, now what? Um, yeah, which I think most women particularly do. Um, you know, we get to the end of film school and, and go, hmm, okay. So what is the next, where, where do we go from here? Um, the irony is I'm now back teaching at the film school that I went through um, and hopefully trying to address some of those questions for, for particularly the women that leave um, and trying to bridge some of those gaps. But, um, but yeah, my, my trajectory is a little, little similar in some ways. You know, I worked in sound, um, in sound design um, because I guess I didn't know that women weren't make, meant to make genre films and they were the films I made at film school. They were all action adventures. Um, and, then, um, and then that was what I wanted to make and I, I still wanna make. I've got a speculative fiction sci-fi that I want as my next feature film and everyone looks at me going, um, really, I don't think so, Angie. That's a big- uh, Yeah, back it. Film. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, uh, and, um, I was very fortunate though, I, I, um, I did get some government funding from Film Victoria to make a short film, which was, you know, very hard to get. We were just incredibly lucky. It was like winning the lottery. There was two short films funded a year and we were one of them. And, um, and that film was Bowl Me Over and it was a comedy and it won uh, Best Comedy at St Kilda Film Festival. And from that, I got approached by a television commercials director and um, got to play with commercials for a while, which was kind of great and not great as well. Um, uh, and, and then I just went into academia and, and went, I really want to find my voice again and want to make the films I want to make. Um, and, and actually, that's where I made Birthday Girl. I actually you know, I got sick of students complaining that they couldn't shoot a film in a weekend and they couldn't find any locations. And I said, this brilliant locations right here in the halls of, you know, the university. And that's where we shot Birthday Girl. And, and you know, it looks like a hospital because it's really institutionalized and it's just really great production design. Had a really awesome team of people and, and it was super fun to make. And, you know, it's also great to be able to say to the students, look, look what we could do on the weekend. And they go, oh, really? Shut up. Um, but, you know, um, and, and yeah, so I've since made a feature film um, much the same way as Megan did. You know, you, you kind of get sick of waiting and trying to get your big budget speculative fiction sci-fi up that no one's going to fund as a first feature. And you kind of realise that at some point and go, yeah, all right, maybe I'll make another little smaller film. Um, and yeah. But, you know, I'm still hoping to get that big budget feature up one day. It is, it is tricky trying to navigate, um, well, find the line between what your heart says you want to follow, what your passion projects are, but also being strategic about where the opportunities are sitting in reality and also not compromising on your vision. It's, it's a really hard line, and particularly in, particularly in genre. Um, Bryony, do you want to talk about some of the challenges women in genre specifically face from your perspective? Um, I mean, there are all of the challenges that we face in general as, as women filmmakers, I guess, and I think a lot of people know about those. But in, in genre particularly, I guess, there are certain stereotypes about what a horror director looks like, for example, that can be really limiting. Um, you know, on the festival circuit, it wouldn't be unusual to go to an event and have a big lineup of, you know, guys in black t-shirts. And, and then there's one woman who just doesn't look like she belongs there. And of course, those subliminal ideas kind of sink in over time. Um, 
but I think, I mean, my uh, big thing that I'm interested in is um, genre definitions and the limitations of genre definitions, because I think there's, there's huge discussions all the time whenever a project like this comes out, and there has been around this one already as well, of, um, oh, but that's not really horror. I don't know if that's horror. It's not really as scary as I wanted, or, it, you know, some of it's scary, some of it, there's a very, um, there's a very limited idea in the public imagination sometimes, I guess, of what horror itself means. And that's because it has been marketed strangely. Um, you know, there was a stigma around the word horror and often filmmakers called horror films thrillers to get around that stigma. So there's a lot of confusion around what it even means to begin with. But then I find particularly when women make horror, um, People don't really mean to, but in a sort of gatekeeping way, they try to define what horror is and they try to put women on the outside of it often. Um, so they'll kind of say, well, that's a really interesting story, but it's not horror. And I'm not sure why there is that instinct in people because really, unless you're an academic or you're writing a dictionary or something, um, <laughs> who actually cares what the definition is? I mean, I don't anymore I'm sort of sick of having the conversation to be honest but but there's this kind of um really strange instinct to just sort of keep defining these goalposts and I've noticed over time that it doesn't happen in the same way for male filmmakers so for example um someone like Ben Wheatley could make something really weird and trippy and arty and be totally accepted in the horror circuit and get you know the big prizes in the press and all of that and if a woman made something like that it would be kind of like it just wouldn't be centered in the same way because it'd be like, oh, well, it's interesting. That's her unique voice, but it's not horror. So we're not going to put it on the big screen. Yeah. Um, so the, the, this kind of, um, that latitude isn't sort of allowed for women in some ways. And I mean, it's obviously because men have been controlling the film industry. So they've kind of been, been defining things in the way that makes sense to them. But it's so ludicrous when you look back at the origins of the horror genre and people like Mary Shelley and <laughs> what she was talking about, which was reproduction and the most primal feelings of a woman through the, you know, the vehicle of Frankenstein. And you just think, how did we get to this situation where the, these sort of men are um, excluding women from horror? Like it's absurd. So Absolutely. there's all sorts of repercussions from that in terms of the way people protect their turf and the trolling of women filmmakers and all, so all sorts of things like that that are ongoing, even though um, in some ways we've made a quite a lot of progress, but in other ways um, things haven't shifted that much at all, I don't think. Yeah, absolutely. Katrina, you are desperately wanting to jump in on here. But let's... I know, I'm like, yes, Ronnie, yes. Um, okay. I just, I guess, what I, what, sorry? I was planning you. you <laughs> I guess what I want to say, and speaking to what you're talking about, Bryony, and that's that we have to understand that the dominant power, the person who holds the most money, who has the most power, those people, they always create the definitions, definitions of beauty, definitions of what, and in this case, the definitions of what's horror. And so that's why, even though we actually live as women and, um, and uh, you know, people who are gender diverse as well, right, or people who are, um, you know, in um, disability, like we live horror daily and yet because we aren't in the dominant passion within this genre and this genre we don't get to define what horror is which is bullshit oh sorry i don't know if i'm allowed to swear which is bull right so um that's why that's why it's so important when we have um people like bryony and um, megan who come around and sit up and say actually you know this entire festival that um, bryony created was constantly getting like well what's women's horror what's women's horror it's like okay it's us and that's scary to you because we're saying what we want to say in all the variety of ways that we want to say it. And, and that's, it's about taking that power and saying we get to make the def definitions, not you. Absolutely, 100%. And I think it's really interesting as well, like going off what Bryony was talking about in terms of the origins of the horror genre. Obviously, it goes back well before even Mary, um, Mary Shelley. So Katrina, your project uh, as part of this is the White Song, which is an Indonesian ghost story. And Jubs, yours is actually a dreaming story as well. Do you want to talk about, do, would either of you like to come in on this conversation here? Jub, you go first. I'm just, I'm finding my unmute button. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> it. 
yeah of course like I grew up being terrified all the time by my family they thought it was hilarious you know every time we'd go camping they'd find the most darkest desolate place and tell us kids the worst stories and I loved it <laughs> and, so, and so pretty much story time um it's my first short film as well um I was a, approached by um Ani Lynette Narkle who at the time was the Indigenous Film Coordinator for Screen West and she pretty much came into Yuri Yarkin because I, I come from a background of theatre uh and she's like does anyone want to make a film <laughs> I was like yeah I do um and so yeah I was I was uh, given a, a, a bit of cash and went and shot this film and and when I was asked, you know, what sort of story do you want to tell? I was straight away, I was like, oh my God, I want to do a supernatural thriller. Of course I do. This is, this is, my, this is my thing. Um, and so one of the most scariest stories I know is, is of the Gunbun woman from the mangroves. Um, and of course, our, uh, for us mob, those things aren't fantastical. They're, they're real. You know they they exist in the environment and you got you know not everyone gets to see them thank god but uh <laughs> and so yeah my my first uh short story time um we shot it uh it was um it did its little festival rounds and this was like a 15 maybe even oh god i'm giving my age away but yeah like 17 maybe years ago um and then, you know, I was really lucky um, that Animal Logic sister company, Truant Pictures, um, uh, saw it somehow and approached me to turn it into a feature. So, and then, of course, the beautiful ladies here um, at NZO approached um, uh, me and said, oh, well, no, I take that back. The new uh, Indigenous film coordinator from Screen West um, Davina McPherson sent me the link that you guys were sending out going oh my god they're looking for horrors Javi you've got a horror this is your this is your platform uh, and so I sent it in and and this this little story that started off from my ancestors has just found these beautiful little homes to just you know inspire and terrify a new generation of children excellent because <laughs> that's what we want <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. Uh, same, same for me, Jeff. Like that, the Kuntil Anak, which is the ghost that um, is uh, at the center of my story. Um, it just terrified me as a kid. I grew up in Indonesia and in Jakarta, and um, I was terrified, terrified of her. And 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 like like you say too, Jeff. It's like this is our. This isn't a story. This is real. This is real for us. And in fact, I, what I think I noticed is when I was shooting it, I remember I had this, you know a lot of Indonesian people working on it. Um, but I also had. Um, um, a lot of white people working on it. And so I had to have this meeting with the crew and the kind of cast and say, okay, um, we're going to discuss, um, you know, culturally discuss this piece of work that we're all about to commit to. And I remember um, I think so the first thing you have to understand is this is real for us, the Kuntalanak. And I could hear people kind of going, right, especially people who know me and they kind of have that white lens of, of me. And then they have, I have all my Indonesian friends. They're like, oh yeah, I have a Kuntalanak in my house. Or when I was a kid, you know, and they start talking about this ghost and they're all, I can see the eyes just getting wider and wider of our, of our crew. So it was like this cultural, um, cultural lesson as well, which was really good. Um, and and, I mean, my mother was like, you mustn't write about her. She'll come. She'll come. You mustn't write about her. But I did. Um, and, and, I, and for me, I wrote it from the ghost perspective because I was very interested in the trope, um, like the social, like I have a sociology under, undergraduate. So I think in, this, in, in kind of sociologically, what position does this ghost, who's a ghost of a pregnant woman who's usually pregnant from a, um, either a, a, a bad marriage or a rape, like a really um, a unpleasant experiences. And then she dies in birth, comes back and wants to you know, haunt women who are pregnant and, um, and men and children. So like, what position does she hold and why do we hate her so much? Um, you know, because actually she went through a pretty crappy time and it was unfair what happened to her and she's seeking justice. So she's actually a justice seeking ghost. So I wanted to speak from that perspective. Um, and that and that's why through. I, yeah, yeah. In, in, in the film. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Rosie. 
I, I want to say just really quickly to all of you people who I can't see, but I can hear you when you clap, it's so nice, um, is that I, like, I really love all the films, the variety of films that Megan's curated here and, and um, and they're just each each person is, has this different voice and such beautiful voices. Um, I really, um, if you haven't seen the film, I encourage you to see it because there is such a variety of of definitions about what horror is and what that is for each of us. So um, yeah, it's, it's quite uh, a yeah. Of, of female horror and it's very beautiful. Um, and we will keep spruiking it throughout the evening. So this won't be the last time you hear that. Um, I'm just sorry, I'm just gonna say it, it's it, that resonated so much with me with all of my crew on my set as well. And of course I had us all camping in the mangroves um, while we were shooting. <laughs> But it was that whole thing of going, oh, yeah, and then, oh, and more and more. And because I had cultural, um, uh, my uncles and my family as cultural kind of cocoons around this shoot because of what we were shooting. Because in our culture as well, it's like, don't talk about it, don't write about it, oh, it'll come for you. So I, I know exactly what you're talking about, Katrina. Um, but, yeah, it was that whole learning process for everybody. <laughs> and I had my poor nephew play the kid who gets taken. And, and for years, everyone was like, is Jai Jai okay? <laughs> too good but it is it's also so again I wanted to throw to you here for the segment that you did the book of dark whispers because um from the interview that you did the other day with SBS um which is where you can watch it um <laughs> you were talking about how the the secrets that the women's circles and the um the stories that we that get passed down generations or between friends and the impact they have on each of us. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, so, you know, Brian and I were curating it together and we were, so when we did the call out, we didn't actually have a particular theme. So I did a call out, I think July, 2018 through IF, basically saying, if you've got a horror film and you're, um, and you live in Australia and you're a woman, send it through. Um, and as we were going through them, uh, we were trying to decide, well, okay, what's going to be the unifying themes? And the original title of the film was actually Dark Lessons, which isn't as sexy as Dark Whispers. So, <laughs> so it didn't stick. But I think the idea behind that was actually what I meant. And I think it's that idea that as, um, I mean, all of us, you know, no matter what gender you are, are brought up in a culture that um, passes down a legacy of the way to behave, social norms, um, you know, the way to treat each other well, ethics, values, all that kind of stuff. But I think particularly as women, we are told quietly, this is how you need to behave in the world in order to, you know, survive. Like, here's how you have a good life. Here are how you get the things you want. Here is how you don't get killed. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's serious. Yeah. And it's not always said in those ways, but it's, you know, don't wear that don't catch a taxi home, you know, at night on your own. Don't walk here. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. And even then, that's not going to guarantee your safety. So the idea, though, is us getting all of these, no, you have to do these things to keep yourself safe, but also how do we, you know, be free and live and enjoy life and trust people. And trust people. And so it's that idea, I mean, the whole, you know, in the film, it's kind of giving it away, but not really. It's the idea that you really have to face the darkness and look at the darkness and see what that darkness is. And then you can carry through that darkness towards the light. It's that, you know, that kind of a life lesson. And I feel like that each of the, you know, some of the segments are, um, you know, there's a few comedic seg segments that are a lot funner. So, you know, they're not all fully heavy, heavy, but it is that idea that, um, I don't know, I feel like horror is often, you know, it's kind of like those dark fairy tales that we all read when we were growing up. There, there's lessons in them or, you know, little comments about things you might just have to be aware of. Absolutely. I'm going to pivot this one slightly and throw across the person in the corner who hasn't said very much. Um, <laughs> uh, to ask about just in general, more broadly in genre in Australia, it's a unique place to be positioned in a very competitive industry. Um, Enzo, can you talk through some of that? Uh, yeah, sure. Look, it's interesting hearing uh, the conversation thus far about um, uh, the challenges for all of these filmmakers in genre as women because gender aside horror in particular has such a stigma against it um in a lot of ways in in you know the layers that are there that make a great horror film um can be deceptive when you're in there trying to pitch something trying to get something off the ground um 
you say the word horror and there is immediately a, uh, a preconception that comes with that, which they're not listening past that. They're like, oh yeah, horror, right. Blood, gore, killing high body counts. Got it, I know what, you, I know what you're pitching me. And the, the sophistic, any sophistication that comes after that just gets completely and utterly missed. Um, so, you know, the, the, the fact that um, uh, all these filmmakers as women, you're trying to get this, there's a whole other level of stuff that you guys are having to deal with as well in the room is, is, is really, um, I just don't, it's a miracle anything gets made. Yeah. And let alone intersectionality when you're layering other different identities on top of that, being right. female not identifying and all of the different things. 100%. So, um, but um, there was something I was going to say, now it's escaped my brain. So, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, no, I think uh, that it's part of the reason that this particular project, to bring it back to this one, um, started sucking me in more and more as we got into it because every... Uh, every film that uh, Megan and Bryony curated, we, we think this is going to be in, and we think it's that. And you, looking over the spectrum of it, they're so unique. They're so across the um, the length and Some breadth of. <laughs> behind you, behind you. Um, they, they, they span the breadth of what horror as a genre can be. Was what I was going to say. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Well, that's okay. <laughs> It was just uh, so well timed. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't not. Um, well, yes, it's such a testament that all of these films have been made. And I think you said you had 50 submissions. Yeah, over 50 submissions. So, Phenomenal. Yeah, and we look, we had a lot of, um, you know, I obviously love all of these films. I wouldn't have chosen them if I didn't love them. But, you know, I often say to people, I had to say no to a, a lot of films that I thought were really great. And, and, and I just want to remind, there's a lot of filmmakers in the audience, and this isn't just about this film, but it's like you submit your film to festivals, you put your applications in, and you get no's, and you get no's, and you get no's, because there's so much content and it doesn't mean that your project isn't worthwhile and it doesn't mean that it isn't valuable it means it just wasn't right for that particular thing and that was the case in this one there was a lot of really great films that just didn't quite fit this so absolutely it's such a competitive industry and we're all suckers for being in it <laughs> <laughs> is that the takeaway no um we're all in <laughs> sorry inspirational Rosie <laughs> inspirational <laughs> Anyone who knows me, this is the flip side of what you don't usually see. <laughs> but it is like we we work so hard, and there is there is so much passion and love and dedication that gets put into everything that gets made um, by everyone. And it is it it is a really a really tough um, industry to be in. But there are such incredible people, like just the people in this room and on these this Zoom and sitting with me up here are all absolutely inspirational. And I honestly wouldn't be here without you. But yeah, <laughs> um, let's keep moving on though. In terms of how to navigate how tricky the industry is, what can filmmakers do? What strategies have each of you done to be able to get through because it is a hard landscape who who said they wanted to speak to that I can't remember who wants to jump in with some pointers on how to go through it Katrina I will um yeah you you need really good friends a hundred percent you need people you love you trust who are there no matter what they'll celebrate your wins they will like understand when you're down and or it's down and also get that remind you that it's not always you. It's really important, I think, to have people around you who will remind you that it's not always you, um, that there is a system um, that we are all living in and that system doesn't always preference our voices. And um, so if you're getting no's like Megan did with Crushed, you know, it's not always you. And um, that's why, again, you know, the uh, Strange With My Face Festival, which by the way, has not had funding, which is why Bryony hasn't run it again. Um, and should be funded because look what's come out of it, come out of all, not just this project, all of us knowing each other with um, Women in Film and Television Australia. Like there are so many of us who have come out of this particular one person, Bryony Kidd, calling us all in and saying, hey, you know, <laughs> I love weird and you're all awesome. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, joining us together. So that, that community, um, people often talk about the industry. I really am interested in the community. So yes, you're entering the industry, but you've got, to, you've got to have a community to enter it with. 
so that's okay. just jump in very quickly WIFT Australia is a direct result of Stranger With My Face so for those of you who are familiar with WIFT so WIFT New South Wales has been around for you know almost four decades um, and um, the sausage party protest if those of you don't know what that is look up hashtag actor sausage party you'll be <laughs> explained <laughs> don't yeah um make sure you put in actor you might get something, you <laughs> yeah. might get something entirely different <laughs> But long story short, I went down after that protest to um, Stranger With My Face in Tassie and Katrina, we'd never met before, and, but we'd been online and Katrina was like, oh my God, we need a whiff in Queensland. And I was like, hold up. Mm -hmm. We don't need to have 500 not-for-profit organisations. Let's just have one. Yeah. And she was like, well, then let's create a WIFT Australia. And then, so, you know, WIFT New South Wales doesn't exist anymore because it's been pushed up to WIFT Oz. So like... Yeah. That's stranger with my face. I don't think that would have happened without that conversation. Amazing, amazing, the things that happen, incredible. Um, yes, exactly. If, Rosie, if I could just speak to that yes, for please. a second. I think that it's um, a really good example of what going out there and creating an opportunity for yourself looks like. Um, and I think, as I was thinking about your question, that was probably gonna be somewhat what that was going to be my answer was the worst thing you can do is wait for it wait for an opportunity try and work out how to do it the best thing you can do is get out there and do um you know megan and i have worked together as a result of um meeting at, at the festival but also this project led to you coming on board dead house dark you know um we've known each other for years rosie you came on board because of an audition that you did years ago for a project. It's Which like, I didn't get, by the way. <laughs> that's another story for another time. Um, but, you know, if you're out, if you're putting yourself out there, you're meeting people, starting communities, running film festivals, the thankless task of, you know, uh, Bryn, who I think is here somewhere, and I ran one last year. I just, it's, I don't know how you do it with no money. It's ridiculous. Um, uh, so well done. That was a compliment, even though it might not have sounded like what <laughs> Bryony. But you know, doing these things are what cause what open up the opportunities yeah. for you to be, you know, uh, you be ready when they come up. But they're not just going to present themselves. Get out there, do it. That's how you meet the people. That's how you yeah. get it done. Absolutely, Angie, you're nodding again. Do you want to jump on in? I I, I think mine's just a quick takeaway, but really it just follows on what Enzo was saying about you know perseverance. Um, you, you just, you will find your people, you will find your audience, but you have to just keep plugging away. And I think the other thing from that is um, not being afraid to fail. We've, you know, that's, that's part of the creative process is you make work and you go, oh, what was I trying to say there? And, you know, sometimes it doesn't come off the way you want it to, but you just, you just can't know everything. And the only way you'll get better is to keep making. Um, and I think that tends to be a little gendered is that often women think we need to know everything in order for us to master it. And God knows I know that. I've, I've done a master's and a PhD and I still don't know anything. So, you know, what a waste. What a waste of those years. Um, but, you know, I do, I do think it's really just, just keep making, just keep making and it's got easier to make. So, you know, you will find, I mean, you know, we're all very, very lucky that Megan put this together and our projects found an, another life which was just terrific, you know. Absolutely. There is the complexity around making things where you do need to, where you fail publicly or you don't necessarily have um, all of the resources behind you to do the thing perfectly in that uh, it's a very critical world out there. And thankfully, yes, Marion, do you want to jump in on that? Uh, yeah, well, I made a uh, my first feature film, which I, which was about an ambivalent woman, uh, and was to me a kind of a horror film because it was the visitors from hell. Um, was marketed as a romantic comedy. That's fine. The distributor needs to do what they need to do, you know, and put it in a box. But it was made for women thirty five plus, and you know. And you put yourself out there, which you do, you know, it's a first feature and it's got all of the flaws and the problems that you would expect with the first feature. Um, but I was happy with it. So that was okay. That was good. But what I realized when the, and also we went out the same week as Crazy Rich Asians, 
the book club and the wife which were all targeted at my audience and those three films I think took 98% of the available box office for three weeks so that left two percent for the other 16 films on release so I think maybe my film did 100 grand something tiny tiny specs right uh, the distributors were utterly delightful and gracious in in defeat and were just really wonderful to me but what I discovered was that the two major male critics who were over 50 and white hated it. They absolutely hated this woman. They didn't hate the performance, right? You know, all the actors got nice, nice kind of write-ups. They just absolutely hated the idea that an ambivalent woman would leave this seemingly, uh, you know, handsome, nice guy for an older man or a different life, which wasn't what the film was about at all. But that is that is not how the male view of that film was interpreted. Now, there's nothing I can do about that because women don't necessarily go on to IMDb and rate and they don't go on to Rotten Tomatoes. And, you know, I think it's two to one, female critics to male critics. And the women who did watch it, who were in the target, loved it. And that was very rewarding. But as a female filmmaker, you're, you're, you're putting yourself out there and the way that critiques work now is um, it's better to be negative and, and get, you know, grabby quotes and things like that, you know, the cult of personality of the critic. And instead of just for one newspaper, now everything's been amalgamated. So you might get a horrific review, which will go out to 80 newspapers. And when people look up, to go and see a film like everybody else and put it into Google, that's the review that comes up first. So it was really for me a huge lesson in, because of course you feel terrible, it's it's awful, you know, to read terrible things about your work, but you know, got to get on, you put yourself out there, as you say, you put yourself out there, you're going to get, um, you're going to have to deal with what happens, that's the name of the game. And how did you deal with what happens? How did you how did you take steps forwards after that? Um, well, uh, I wrote a lot. Um, and I kind of had an inkling before it came out from what men were saying to me who'd seen the film. I kind of, there were little bells ringing and I'm thinking, oh, they really hate her. You know, they hate the protagonist. And so I was almost prepared, but um, I, I can't, you know, I just kept working, basically. I, I went on a recce for something. I was writing something, um, you know, and uh, I mean, this year I made a, a dating cooking show for 50 plus singles for community TV called Recipe for Love. And that was fun. So it's just kind of doing things that I hadn't done before. So like your resilience. And I think that's the thing in order resilience, to- Resilience, yeah. The resilience that you need. And I think it's also the idea that, um, you need to, um, rather than measure yourself by the external success or failure, it's measuring it by the values that you have. And if that's an important thing that you want to get out there and you are able to express that, then that is, that's the whole point of why we make art. Like we make art to express a point of view and you found those audience members and they got it. Yeah. And that was the point of the project. And so I guess the, the takeaway for me is that if you're ever watching a movie that's been created by female film, filmmakers in particular and you like it and you get it and you've got an IMDb Pro account, jump on there and write a review. Don't give it 10 stars though because they'll actually not use mm. it. Give it nine stars. <laughs> but, but get on there and rate it because we need more um, people who respond to female-led stories positively being active and, and public about it. Um, I would love to know, with a quick show of hands, do people have burning questions in the audience? Or are you having with, it, with this just jibber-jabbering and carrying on? Oh, we do have one up there. Okay, great. We need, we need it on a mic so the okay, people could hear right. it. I, was just... we, um, I can run this up. Oh, no, no, for the recording, we need it to be on mic. I'll hold it. Okay. Hey, this one's for the Tasmanian. Uh, her name is Bryony. Say again, sorry. Bryony. Hey, Bryony. Um, so, hey. Um, so, within Australian literature, there exists the genre of Tasmanian Gothic, which has been traced back to like 18th century 
Australian, right? Mm -hmm. Now, my question is, is though there has been probably 20 novels written in the past decade under that genre by Tasmanian writers, why does it not permeate into indie film or or mainstream film or uh, really any kind of uh, stage production? It doesn't really permeate at all outside the island. And you um, have- Is that the end of the question? I should wait and, and make sure that's the, actually the end of it before I ask. Yeah, that's the end. Thank you. Why, why it doesn't permeate? I actually, I actually think it does permeate. I mean, um, Tasmanian Gothic is really a very evolving term, and it, but it's actually developed quite rapidly over the last couple of years because there's been stuff like um, Mona with uh, the Dark Mofo Festival. There's been all sorts of activity, my festival as well, um, around sort of ideas of dark Tasmania and the dark history of Tasmania. And uh, filmmakers have actually been responding to it in all sorts of ways. I mean, I probably have myself with a number of my projects. Um, Vicky, Madden, Vicky Madden, who made the fil- uh, the TV series, uh, The Kettering Incident. I, was thinking, I know she's very aware of that kind of um, mode of storytelling. Her show after that, The Gloaming, I think was absolutely sitting in the Tasmanian Gothic. Um, I think there's, there's been actually a lot of debate about it in Tasmania. Is, is it a useful term or is it a bullshit term? Say, similar to the sort of genre debates that I get a bit sick of sometimes with women in horror, we've had that debate about Tasmanian Gothic where some people in Tasmania have said, oh, we're really sick of this gloomy bullshit, it's a fabrication. And then other people have said, um, you know, no, we like it, but it doesn't really encompass the true experience, say, of, you know, Aboriginal Tasmanians, which, it, you know, it doesn't because it's very much a European construct, the way it developed. Um, and, yeah, so there's actually a huge debate around it. Um, and so maybe you'll have to come down here and uh, get into some discussions about that. Yeah, two other key projects that are sit in that genre, The Nightingale and SBS's new show, The Tailings, as well. Absolutely, yeah. Um, but you're right, it is, it's an interesting conversation, the fact that it is a, quite a colonial perspective of Tasmania uh, is... Yeah, I mean, I think, again, it's, it's actually up to us to in, reinvent it or imagine what that term even means now, because we're the contemporary artists and we can ex- extrapolate from that history and it can change over time. Um, Donna McRae, who a lot of us know, who's a, another filmmaker who works in this area, talks a lot in her academic work about the Australian female Gothic. And she has put uh, Stranger With My Face in that context and some of the films that came out of that as well. So there's all sorts of ways of um, talking about the sort of movements and styles and what's happening. And I think it's all really valid as long as it doesn't sort of limit people or make them feel like they're boxed into anything. Absolutely. Were there other questions? Yes, we've got one in the center just behind you. This is a general question about um, earlier um, the talk about the, the definitions of horror and the latitude in that enabled to men that's not allowed to women. So Ben Wheatley being the example given. Do you think that's shifting? And if not shifting enough, what do you think it will take? Does one of the Zoom ladies want to talk to that? Um, I'll just jump in for a second. I think it is shifting a tiny bit because um, I actually think some of the festivals are similar to my perspective and maybe, you know, Bryn and Enzo and some of the other people who run horror festivals feel the same way. Like we, we actually get kind of sick of being pigeonholed anyway. So I think from the festival programmer perspective, you know, a lot of the best, um, I guess, dark genre festivals in the world don't necessarily call themselves horror and want to just open that up more. And so a film like Isabel Papad's, um, Isabel's and Josie Hess's documentary Morgana, which is not horror at all, um, has, well, it has dark elements, has screened you know, at some of the top genre festivals in the world alongside horror. Because we're all interested actually in the connections between things and the, you know, what inspires 
it's horror or horror adjacent or whatever it might be. So I think the people who know what they're talking about and who actually work, you know, with filmmakers and are filmmakers, um, you know, we're keen to leave that those kind of limiting categories behind. But sometimes you just get mainstream journalists who are really stuck in the past. And so they sort of keep dragging the conversation back to these um, really simplistic perspectives like you know year after year in um, women in horror month or when my festival would come around we'd have that kind of oh do women like horror that's funny we thought they were really scared and it, it, the same thing would happen year after year and we have all the same articles listing all the same films and it's just really tedious and quite frankly they haven't done their homework when they keep doing that so hopefully, um, it, you know, some of the better film journalists and critics are moving on from that and we can sort of start to actually talk about the many themes and the many exciting subjects and characters that we all want to explore and just move beyond, oh, it's so weird that women like scary movies. <laughs> we live scary movies. <laughs> <laughs> Katrina's, Katrina's going to... Oh, gotcha. Yeah, can I add that? Can I just add that um, there is this, there are an amazing, um, as Brian's talking about festivals, like because, you know, there's a really cool, um, I don't know if anyone in the audience is, is if you're um, a woman and you're into horror um, or you're, you know, gender diverse and you're into horror, like there's a really cool network. Um, so, you know, what you're looking at here is a network that's in Australia and we've got other people outside of this who aren't here who are also within the um, women's horror network in Australia. And um, that's also, there's a global network as well. You know, um, and I've got to know them through Bryony and through um, being introduced online. And so we're really strong in terms of supporting each other. And it's interesting because like when Jason Blum came out with his like, oh, there's no women <laughs> directors in horror. I don't know if anyone followed that, but he just got pummeled. Like immediately everyone was like, oh, really? Here's a bunch of names. And pretty quickly, he to his credit, pretty quickly, he sort of went, oh, schooled. You know, I've been schooled. I was wrong. I was very, very wrong. Um, and so, you know, I think that there is, um, and I talked about community before, like the power of community and voice to shift discussion and raise education around um, how, what, what's, what's constructing, what's, what's blocking our minds and how to open that up into a way that's just gonna make it a more exciting world, you know, more exciting for genre. Absolutely. Did you want to jump in, Megan? Oh, I, I, I'll, I'll just say that I think it's, it's, it's this idea that, you know, um, yeah, the definitions that bind us into these boxes rather than let us kind of get out and explore what we're really interested in. And, and if we didn't write the rules to begin with, then it's not just constraining to us as women, it's constraining to everyone. It's like, you know, Enzo was talking about horror, how, you know, you say the word horror and there's automatically a, a, a distaste around what it, what it could be. And it's like the fact that more diverse voices are now able to, you know, find platforms, I think is good for everybody because it means we can all start exploring ideas that may not necessarily be permitted, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, the expansion of content is possibly working in, in the favor here. Was there another question? And this might be the last one that we have. Oh, yep, over here. Thank you. Sorry if I missed anybody. Yeah. Hello, uh, my question's about funding actually. Um, so the funding bodies in Australia seem to be moving further and further away from wanting to fund indie films and smaller films. Um, I guess I, I want to, refer to your collective wisdom, would you suggest that we be gung-ho about going after this funding when it seems so out of our grasp or do we make small budget films and do as best as we can? In your experience, what would be the better way to go? That's a really, really hard one. <laughs> um, I'm not going to lie. It is um, obviously a very complex time that we are all in this industry in um, right now as some changes are happening and coming very quickly at us at the end of financial year. Um, independent films are going to be harder to get up on the smaller scale. But I guess there's the other part of the question that I would ask is, where are there other opportunities for funding? Um, if anyone, obviously we're all in Sydney at the moment physically, but if anyone is actually from Victoria, there was the announcement, the partnership with Film Vic and SBS today around independent films and looking for unique voices. Um, different places are trying to find different ways through and if it's not necessarily 
If your story might have some flexibility in it, is there potential for it to be a digital series instead, if you're still looking for agency finance? Um, but if you do want to stick with the vision that you have and figure out how to finance it completely out of the system, then Megan's your person to talk to. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's pretty exhausting. I mean, look, I think Enzo, Enzo would have plenty to say on this as well. Um, I, I, when it comes to, because I think there's a couple of different ways I can interpret what you're asking. So it's the idea of, okay, do I try and work in the system? Do I work outside the system? Do I try and work in the system? Do I work outside the system? That's actually what I'm pretty sure that most of us, that's how we constantly think, we cycle. So, you know, we'll be like, okay, I've just made this project right now, I've just made Dark Whispers, it's on SBS. I'm, my, my, one of my episodes is in Dead House Dark, which comes out, which is on Shudder at the end of April. I really hope that those two projects now mean that I have the stamp of approval and I can get some funding and I don't have to, like, it's really, 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 really hard. I can't make another project this way. I think, you, you know, you've got one or maybe two in your system. It's not sustainable. But what it's done is it's created a whole bunch of relationships. I have been able to explore my voice. Now I need to go in a more, I'm not saying it's traditional route, because I think I'm a very innovative and a strategic person in the way I approach trying to come up with things. But what I guess I'm saying is um, I think that you need to... Um, you need to put your you need to put it yourself out there in order to receive that funding because if you don't you can't complain about not getting it but if you're trying to get that funding and you've been trying for 18 months and you're not getting anything there's it could be a number of reasons why you're not getting it you might not be good enough what you're doing might not be right for what they're after right now which doesn't have any that doesn't mean that what you're doing isn't valuable it means it's just not what is on their agenda um i don't even know what the third one is but i'm, I'm sure there's a third one but long story short if you keep trying to knock on that door and knock on that door and it's 18 months then that door's not for you and you need to then understand, okay, what is it that's going to make me feel okay as a creative person? Like, where's my outlet? What can I afford to do financially and emotionally? And between those three things, find a project that you have capacity to do that's going to fulfill those things and the community in which that you can make that happen. Enzo? Yeah, you probably covered most of what I was going to say. But in short, I think if you're thinking about what's attainable and, and not attainable, like it's only unattainable until it's not. I know that sounds really trite, but it is about continuing to uh, push, try, work out why it's not working, if it's not working. If you really have a burning, um, uh, if there's a fire in your belly for the project that you're trying to get up, you'll find a way. Um, we've all done it in the past. It's just, it's in us to not stop um, and not get told no. Um, for better or for worse, but I think. <laughs> I just want to put some caveats in on a couple of things that were just said. Um, and this might just be a personal, personal sensitivity of mine. I, the term of not good enough for me is something that my triggers go, huh. Um, <laughs> so, um, because there is always a, a subjectivity on how things are being perceived. And I guess part of the question, having sat on the side of needing to assess Screen Australia applications, um, and, and make those decisions. Sometimes for me, it was having picking up the phone and talking with the filmmaker on the other side and explaining some of the priorities were, or even um, some of the answers that we were looking for in some of the questions. And so as a filmmaker, having had sat on both sides, being the person who slogged it out on the applications that don't go anywhere and just being lost, um, feeling like I wasn't good enough, thankfully now, I've been able to build relationships with people on the other side to say, okay, then why wasn't this good enough? Can you explain to me where I fell over? If that is the pathway that I still wanted to go through, can I, what can I learn here in this in terms of potentially structuring a more um, supportive and incredibly uh, competitive team or any of the bits and pieces? So I guess the, lo the short version of what I'm attempting to say is it might be worth um, also having a look at the information that you have available to you and which other um, relationships you can potentially build to get more information to try and um, build strong applications for agency funding if that is the pathway you want to go down. Because doing it outside of the agency, as Megan says, there, you only have so many in you <laughs> until you just get exhausted. 
Um, we are getting the wrap-up signals, but I do, I would really like to do a quick fire round around everybody as a final takeaways, um, hopefully to motivate people um, and leave us on a high note. So Megan, do you wanna kick us off? Yes, so um, I think two things. One, things that I wish that I had known and I've learned over the years is um, when you do start finding the people who you work with and the relationship you're building and you decide to um, make a film with them or a big project or something, it's making sure that you have the same values for the project that you're doing will serve you really, really well because it's like a marriage. So you really, you know, it's harder than a marriage now. <laughs> kind of. Anyway, there's that. And then the other thing is, is that you like, I, you know, I went to film school. I went, you know, I did actually do a lot of study and, you know, I thought, okay, when I leave, I'm going to get the job and then, you know, I'm going to, you know, I won't have to do that shitty, this job, shitty cafe job, shitty bar job, shitty office job, whatever. That's unlikely to happen to 99.5% of us. And I've changed my view. It's not like having an, you know, when people say, what's your B plan? Get rid of that idea of a B plan. We have strands of income and strands of work and they fulfill different things and different times of your life. The money earning one's gonna be more important. And in other parts of your life, the creative one's gonna be more important. So don't beat yourself up if you're like, I'm still working this office job. I'm still working the office job. And actually that office job means I'm not using up this brain power at that office job and when I go home on my non-office job days I can be creative so don't feel bad about having a slate of, of income that was a very long short answer sorry <laughs> it's a good answer though I, I, I it's think important. it is it is no I, th I think just just following on from that I think it's really the takeaway from me is just to keep at it find your resilience and you know don't don't let obstacles stop you if you're really trying to get where you're going just keep at it Amazing. Angie. When you um, sorry, yep, couldn't find the mute either. Um, uh, perseverance and resilience, but also don't be afraid of your voice. So your voice, not somebody else's, what you think somebody else wants to see, your own voice is super important. Um, yeah. Excellent. Katrina. Uh, I think um, always ask when you're going to work with somebody or you're working on a project or anything, the question is like, does this feed me or does this eat me? Ask yourself that and then just go for the thing that feeds you. And I'm a glutton. Just go, go, go. Just go. <laughs> Excellent. I love that. <laughs> Marion. Um, first of all, I would say that Bryony's baby is unbelievably cute, even though it's scaring me a lot because it keeps disappearing. Its head keeps disappearing. It's frightening. But it's gorgeous when you can see it. Um, I would say uh, that your collective is incredibly important, which I guess is echoing a lot of people. Find your producer, find your co-directors, find your co-writers, because, you know, getting from zero to a project is going to be two or three years minimum. Here comes my baby, it's a cat. And um, yeah, find that collective is what I would say. Beautiful. Isabel. Just finding the mute button. Yeah, I just would reiterate, just find your people, you know, um, lean into your own voice, uh, build and treasure your network. That network will get things made. It will get your film written about. It will, you know, get your work out there. And also just be really careful with your time and what you choose to invest that time in. You know, I think as filmmakers and kind of multidisciplinary people like myself, a lot of stuff will come at you, you know, and I think it's um, a temptation to choose easy things out of fear rather than to just, you know, follow something that kind of resonates, you know, in your heart in a major way. So really, you know, choose those things, like as Katrina said, the things that feed you. <laughs> Sorry, Isabel, you're being shown up by Marion's cat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so good. Perfect white job. Oh, uh, well, you know, that's that's another thing too, is the time that a one project takes to you, seven years for a feature, it's not a fallacy, it's true. So you just kind of go, well, I'm going to work on 15 projects at once. <laughs> And each one of them is like a hamster wheel. One is coming into production as another one's going into development and another one is on your mind. So don't just stick to the one project that you're, you're doing. Create, oh my God, did you hear that? There's a massive storm above me. 
um yeah just create 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 um i love um being in the arts working in the arts so when i wasn't writing when i wasn't directing i was a continuity i was a first ad i was a bloody runner i was a casting director i was everything i could be to be on set to be on stage backstage in front of it whatever the hell i could to get as much information and build, yes, those networks, but upskill, upskill, upskill. So you know every aspect of the job that you're doing. So you can have those really beautiful conversations with your heads of department because you've done the job. Amazing, amazing. And Bryony? Um, yeah, I mean, I would say, um, going back to the funding question, actually, I think it's an interesting question. and. Um, you can, in this industry, you can feel like you're emerging for a long time. You can go, be going around in circles for years and years and years. You can be emerging for 20 years, 30 years. You might die and you're still emerging. Like that is a risk. Um, so I think um, surround yourself by good people that you want to work with. Work on stuff that you're excited by. And it doesn't ma necessarily matter if it's all big stuff. Some of it might be feature films. Some of it might be a small theatre project, might be a comic book might be something that you can just do with your friends on the weekend, but like have all these different levels of projects going so that you can feed your actual creativity because that's what's so beautiful and that's why we all do it. Um, but in terms of the funding itself, I think be prepared to do without the funding in case they don't understand what you're talking about and they don't come to the party because that's always very, very possible. But I was really inspired by um, something Gaylene Preston said, who's a legendary uh, New Zealand filmmaker and she was uh, at Strange With My Face one year and, and her attitude was always, well, that's my money. I'm a filmmaker, I'm a New Zealander, that's my money they've got there. I'm gonna go in the door there and get it from them. So <laughs> take that on board as well. Like, okay, they may not understand what you're doing, but that is your money. So <laughs> if there's any way that you can, um, you know, have that confidence, and if there's any way you can disrupt the system and not just work within it, but actually change it as well, um, look for the opportunities to do that because the, the powers that be, like they don't know everything. They don't necessarily know what's gonna work or connect with audiences and you can change their mind and you can challenge their systems. And that's what you often need to do. Oh, and, and can I just say initiatives, 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 look at your screen, West Screen Australia, your state funding bodies, look at all the amazing initiatives that they have going. There's so many that, that as you mentioned before, the one that's just been announced with Robert Connolly and, and SBS and that, and also uh, Australians in Film have just launched Untapped, um, working with incredible, incredible industry professionals to just talk to you about your career and your trajectory. So look at those amazing initiatives that are um, available because they are definitely stepping stones. Absolutely. And SBS's Digital Originals is open again at the moment, as well as um, Screen Queensland just announced Ride Shorts, which is a $55,000 short film fund, which is phenomenal. So, what if is anyone's this? 2005? I know, exactly. <laughs> um, so, on that, I just want to say thank you to everyone. And I do have a list of thank yous, but this has been the most incredible panel that I did not know where it was going to go. <laughs> So to wrap this all up, I just want to say um, Hemlock and Cedar Films has been funded by the City of Sydney Council to run a series of filmmaker workshops on topics such as script writing, directing, acting for camera, feminist horror and so forth, which is going to be led by the Dark Whispers team, yeah. including Megan, Bryony, Katrina, and that's going to be starting from May onwards. Um, alongside the initiatives, the Gender Matters Task Force, which I currently sit on as well, is uh, has mentorships open, which is in partnership with WIF as well. So please sign up through the WIF website, either as a mentor or a mentee. We all have skills that we can share and we've all got things that we can learn. So get on board and share that amongst your people as well, please. Um, and we need to say thank you to Hemlock and Cedar Films, City of Sydney, Actors Centre Australia, Stranger With My Face International Film Festival, the New South Wales chapter of WIFT Australia, Screen Vixens and Film Fatales. Oh, that's a mouthful. Um, <laughs> We have with us people, we have with us people from each of those different organizations. So there are people here from Actors Centre Australia. I don't know if Jess is somewhere here. Nope. No. Molly. 
Uh, in the ACA. Front here. So Excellent. if you have any questions about ACAC, Molly. Um, and from WIFT, we have Yolandi here, and she's in the box. And Vanessa, if Vanessa's up the back, up the back if anyone wants. So if you want to find out about WIFT. And Film Fatales, we have Liz here, down the front here. Um, and so for people who don't know, Film Fatales is specifically for um, female writer directors and the Screen Vixens, um, excellent, wonderful. Suzanne Chambers there. Yeah. Yep. And Screen Vixens is for female producers. And then we have um, Stranger With My Face uh, is Bryony, who's on here. Um, but Megan, you'll be able to take yeah, questions. Yeah, I can hook you up if there's any female genre filmmakers or gender diverse filmmakers who may want to be hooked up. Exactly. Yeah. And we are all staying around for a bevy afterwards. So if you have any questions for any of us in person, we are here. Um, and thank you all for joining us on whichever day this is of whichever year we're in. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to show the audience? Oh, actually, if you can, oh, the lights might be too bright. We wanted to show the audience to our incredible panelists. We might be able to leave them to turn the house lights up. Is that okay? We just wanted to show the audience to our participants. And while we're doing that, I just wanted to thank Rosie for moderating this, like, very intricate <laughs> evening. And so for EP, Bryony, all of the filmmakers, like it's been really great to be able to kind of delve into the brains of all these amazing people on this project. And obviously to all of you for coming and supporting independent film, women in film, Australian film, all of that. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you all look beautiful.